Last time, we saw that congestion games can provide highly efficient representations of certain game-theoretic interactions, and can help us efficiently compute Nash equilibria. But since there are lots of interactions that can't be modeled with congestion games, we still need to think about compact representations for more general settings. And in those settings, we can't count on finding pure equilibria, so our compact representation needs to support computing deviation payoffs so that we can find mixed strategy Nash equilibria. And this leads us to the model of action graph games. In an action graph game, we have a set of players, and each player has a set of actions. But then, the combined set of all actions for all players form the nodes in an action graph. In that graph, there is an edge from one action to another if the number of players choosing the first action influences the payoff to someone choosing the second action. And this allows the utility functions to depend only on the neighborhood of an action in the action graph. Whereas, in a normal form game, the utility function can output a different payoff depending on any attribute of the profile, in an action graph game, only the configuration in the neighborhood of an action can influence the payoff. To get a better idea of what we're talking about, let's think about an example, where here we're showing a portion of the action graph in an eight-action game. And specifically, we're showing all of the in edges to the node for action A1. So in this graph, the neighborhood of A1 is the actions 1, 2, 4, 5, and 8. And that means that the payoff to action 1 can only depend on the number of players choosing each of these five actions. So, if there are 30 players in the game, then this might be one profile of actions that they could jointly select. And note that we're thinking of this in much the same way we do for symmetric games, where we're just counting how many players choose each action. But the game need not be strictly symmetric, because different players may have access to different subsets of the actions. But when we limit this profile to just the configuration in the neighborhood of action 1, we get a count for the number of opponents playing each of these actions in the neighborhood. So, when we restrict this profile to just the neighborhood of action 1, we have two opponents playing action 1, and then we preserve the counts for actions 2, 4, 5, and 8, and we lump together all of the players playing actions that are not in the neighborhood. And so, this profile would have the same configuration as many other profiles that also have a total of 14 players choosing some action outside the neighborhood. And since the utility function operates only on the neighborhood configurations, we don't need to worry at all about how the out-of-neighborhood players are arranged, and that saves a huge number of configurations that the action graph game doesn't have to represent. So let's think about what sorts of interactions we can efficiently represent with action graph games. And our first example is a lemonade stand game. The idea here is that we have some number of lemonade and hot dog vendors trying to decide where along a large stretch of beach they're going to locate their stands. And lemonade vendors benefit from being near hot dog vendors because people will often want to buy a hot dog and a lemonade together, but lemonade vendors are hurt by being near other lemonade vendors because that competition reduces the number of people who will buy from them. And so we can represent the decision by all of these vendors of where to locate their stand as an action graph game, where if there are n possible locations along the beach, we have 2n nodes 
corresponding to actions where the lemonade vendors could locate at each of those n spots, and the hot dog vendors could locate at each of those n spots. And since the lemonade vendors benefit from being at the same location or nearby location with a hot dog vendor, we have edges from the adjacent hot dog actions to a given lemonade action. And since the lemonade vendors are hurt by being near another lemonade vendor, we have edges to that lemonade action from each of the adjacent lemonade actions. Then, for each of the nodes in the action graph, we need to store some sort of data structure that captures the payoffs, like we've seen with a normal form game or a symmetric game. And the payoffs that we're storing will capture the beneficial relationship of being near a vendor of the other type and the harmful relationship of being near a vendor of the same type. And they may also capture other aspects, like where along the beach are there more customers. Now one thing to note about this lemonade stand game is that it has some symmetry. It's not a fully symmetric game where all of the players are interchangeable. But the way I've described it, the lemonade stand players all have identical incentives, and the hot dog stand players all have identical incentives. And so we can call this a role symmetric game, where there are two roles, the lemonade roll and the hot dog roll, and within the lemonade roll, all of the players are interchangeable, and likewise within the hot dog roll. So if we think about how large a data structure we'll need to store, for the action graph representation of this game, we can take advantage of that role symmetry in storing the configurations. In particular, if the game has PL lemonade players and PH hot dog players, then the configuration for any particular lemonade action is going to include three lemonade neighbors and three hot dog neighbors, and then the PL lemonade players need to be divided among those three actions plus the out of neighborhood option. And the PH hot dog players need to be divided among the three hot dog actions plus the out of neighborhood option. And to figure out how many neighborhood configurations that gives us, we need to think about how many ways can we assign PL lemonade players into those four possible options. And that leads us to a stars and bars type combinatorial argument, where stars and bars is a way of thinking about putting S stars into B buckets. So here I've illustrated nine stars and three buckets, but we can think of the assignment into three buckets as where to place two bars dividing the stars. So now the question of how many ways can we assign S stars into B buckets is the same as the question of how many ways can we assign into the S plus B minus one positions either the S stars or equivalently the B minus one bars. So if we apply this to the question of how to assign the lemonade players to the three actions and other, well, since we're thinking about a lemonade actions configuration, there are PL minus one lemonade opponents, and they need to be sorted into four buckets. So we'll use three bars. And likewise, we have four hot dog actions and other, and there are PH hot dog opponents. So we'll have PH plus three, choose three ways to assign them. And when we multiply these, that will give us the total number of configurations for a given lemonade stand node. This number of configurations will be the same for all of the interior L vertices, and we'll get something slightly smaller for the first and last. 
and we'll get a very similar result exchanging PL and PH for the H actions. So the total number of configurations for which we need to store the payoff is around this times the number of actions, which is 2n. In the more general case, to figure out the number of configurations we need to store for a particular action node, that depends on the size of that action's neighborhood. In general, it might be possible for any of the players to pick any of the actions in that neighborhood, and so we might need to assign all p-1 opponents over all of the possible actions in the neighborhood plus the outside of neighborhood option. So assigning p-1 opponents over the size of neighborhood plus one options gives us this many possible configurations per action. And if we think about how this binomial grows, since the binomial is the top factorial divided by the bottom factorial and top minus bottom factorial, if we assume that the number of players is much larger than the size of the neighborhood, then we will divide out all but the largest size of neighborhood terms from the top, and so we'll get something that is roughly the number of players raised to the size of the neighborhood, And so the size of the action graph game representation will depend primarily on the size of the neighborhoods. And as long as all of the actions have relatively small neighborhoods, this potentially gives us a quite compact representation, even if the game has a large number of players and a large number of actions. But since our motivation for using action graph games in the first place was to compute potentially mixed strategy Nash equilibria, we also need to think about how we can use these representations to compute deviation payoffs. As usual, our deviation payoff calculation is a sum of probabilities times utilities. But now we are summing over all of the configurations over the neighborhood of action A. The utilities are the ones that we are storing for each of those configurations. And so then it remains to compute the probability of each of those configurations over the neighborhood. And the key step there is that we need to restrict each player's mixed strategy to the neighborhood. So if we're trying to figure out the probability of one of the configurations over action one's neighborhood, and we're looking at the mixed strategy used by player i, that player's action set may not include all of the actions in the game. And so for any actions not in their action set, those will have probability zero. And then even among the actions they're playing, some of them may not be in the neighborhood of action one. And for the actions not in the neighborhood, we'll add up their probabilities to get the probability that the player plays outside the neighborhood. And so when we're multiplying out the probabilities here, we'll get just the product of the two probabilities for actions in the neighborhood and the total probability for all of the actions outside the neighborhood. Now in our probability calculation, we will still have to account for the asymmetric arrangements corresponding to a single configuration. But we've seen a similar problem before when thinking about symmetric games. And in the case that the action graph game happens to be symmetric or role symmetric, we can actually apply many of the same data structure tricks we saw for symmetric games to representing the payoffs for each action in the action graph game.
and achieve many of the same speed ups. And that's in fact why I've already been describing the configurations in terms of the number of opponents. The last question I'd like to consider is what else can we represent with the action graph game type of model? And the answer is quite a lot. First of all, we can represent congestion games as action graph games, where the facilities of the congestion game tell us which actions need to be adjacent because when two actions share a facility, they affect one another's payoffs. And in addition, there's a way that we can augment action graph games by adding function nodes, where a function node is part of the action graph, but isn't actually an action someone can play. And in general, the job of a function node is to perform some simple aggregation over its neighborhood, like counting how many players have played in the neighborhood. And then the payoffs for the actions can depend on the outputs of those function nodes. And using function nodes, we can represent congestion games even more compactly by having a function node for each of the resources that counts how many players are using that resource and outputs the congestion of the resource. And then each of the actions can simply add up the congestion costs for each of the resources that they're using. So, by representing a congestion game as an action graph game, we can calculate deviation payoffs, which means that we can use the action graph game representation to also compute mixed strategy equilibria in congestion games. And that might be of interest if we have a symmetric congestion game, because in general the symmetric equilibrium is going to be mixed. But the downside here is that the action graph game representation requires us to explicitly enumerate all of the actions. And so the trick we saw with congestion games where we can compute best responses on the fly, say in the traffic congestion network, isn't going to work. We can't just leave out all of the actions that never come up in our best response calculations because we need them to be part of the action graph. But action graphs can also represent much more, and in fact, they can represent any normal form game. If we have an arbitrary payoff matrix, we can represent it with an action graph game where each player will have separate actions, and each action node will be adjacent to all of the actions belonging to any of their opponents, so the only edges missing from this graph are the ones between actions of the same player. And then our configuration tables here only need to account for zero or one players choosing each action, since we only have one player who can choose any given action. But we have a very large number of possible configurations for each action because their neighborhoods are so large. And so it turns out that representing an arbitrary normal form game as an action graph game doesn't save any space in terms of the number of profiles and payoffs we have to store. But this does mean that action graph games are fully general. We can use them to represent any game we want. And some of the time when the neighborhoods are small, they will give us a lot of savings and other times they'll be roughly on par with the basic payoff matrix representation. Finally, I want to point out that there's much more depth we could go into with action graph games, as I've hinted at by talking about function nodes. And the original paper about action graph games is very well written, so if you find this interesting, I strongly encourage you to go read it to find out much more.